Many of you already know that when I'm not spending hours churning out YouTube videos, I'm actually an airline captain by trade. What may surprise some of you is that I actually have friends outside the industry, and while I'm perfectly comfortable with the idea of flying at a speed of over 400 knots several miles above the surface of the Earth, some of those friends tell me they find the idea of hurling through the sky in a metal tube piloted by a complete stranger more than a little disconcerting. In fact, some of them have gone so far as to say they must literally make peace with their inevitable death each and every time they strap into their cozy economy class seat. And I can empathize with that. To me, that metal tube, that airliner, is my Monday through Friday office. I've studied its ins and outs to the nth degree, and I've trained for years to know what to expect and how to react to the unexpected. But to many travelers, they're betting their lives on a machine they don't understand. And the unknown is fertile soil for anxiety. All it takes is an intrusive thought about a plane crash they saw once on the news, and it's easy to see how quickly a minor uneasiness can spiral into a maelstrom of terror. Which is a shame, because flying is no less than a modern miracle. Aviation is my passion, and I want people to feel the same level of wonder and enthusiasm that I feel about it without fear. So how do I plan to accomplish this? By meeting some of people's greatest fears when it comes to flying head-on. Laying out the facts and explaining everything the aviation industry has done to address those concerns. My hope is that by demystifying the unknown, you'll have the same comforting knowledge that allows me to step into that cockpit without fear. If I could assuage even a fraction of this fear for someone and make flying a more pleasant experience for them, I'll consider this video a success. So while we're at it, let's tackle one of the biggest fears out there. What happens if we lose an engine? Well, let me explain. When an airliner or any multi-engine aircraft loses an engine, there's an appreciable drop in overall performance. After all, we just lost up to half of our available thrust. But here's the thing, that isn't too big of a deal. Multi-engine aircraft are actually designed to be flown on a single engine. Aircraft designers are keenly aware of the possibility of an engine failure, and so from the outset, ensure that a single engine is able to provide sufficient thrust to fly the aircraft. Not at all altitudes, mind you, but at a certain point, the plane must be flyable on a single engine. That being said, there are some key things we need to consider in order to fly safely with an inoperative engine. Because the engines are usually mounted on pylons under the wings or connected to the rear fuselage, the loss of one engine creates a unique aerodynamic situation. In short, with one engine down, our thrust is asymmetrical, which means there are a few things we need to do. The first thing to do is to re-establish coordinated flight, which to put it simply, means we need to use the rudder and ailerons to realign the nose of the aircraft with our direction of travel. If we don't do this, we'll travel into the oncoming airstream at an odd angle, which we call side slip. Side slip is terrible, especially on a single engine, because it increases our drag and decreases our already hindered performance even further. Now, if we're in a propeller-driven aircraft, there's another important consideration. Our dead engine has a large propeller spinning out in front of it that isn't doing us much good. If we ignore it, it'll generate tons of drag, as its blades are likely nearly perpendicular to the oncoming airstream. To alleviate this, we do something called feathering the propeller, turning the blades parallel to the air and eliminating most of the drag. However, if we're on a turbofan-driven aircraft like most jet airliners, our fan blades won't be adjustable, so we just have to eat that drag. It's tough luck, but not the end of the day. Once we're coordinated and our drag is minimized, we should be left with a perfectly functional airplane. It's true, we'll have somewhat reduced performance and redundancy, but never fear. Pilots spend thousands of hours building their time on aircraft with only one engine before even touching a multi-engine airplane, so a well-contained engine failure is an unforeseen demotion, but not a huge safety issue. Now, I can imagine some of you might be thinking, well, one engine just failed. What's stopping the other one from failing? That's a great question. The answer is that it depends on the reason for the engine failure. If the reason is fuel starvation or the extremely unlikely ingestion of multiple pieces of foreign object debris, such as birds, at once, which is what happened on US Airways Flight 1549, then I'd say, yes, we may lose both engines. However, that's only happened 41 times in all of recorded history, so it's pretty safe to assume that's not going to happen, and even if it does, you still have likely a, a better than 50% chance of coming out entirely unscathed. Estimates on the odds for turbine engine failure vary by source, but range from 375,000 flight hours per engine failure to about 1 million. So, excluding the very rare cases mentioned above, your odds of being at a total power loss due to two independent engine failures is about 1 in 140,625,000,000 flight hours. To put this into perspective, your odds of winning a Powerball jackpot are 1 in 292 million. So, in most cases, the odds of a second engine failing are astronomically low and not worth considering. However, what might be worth considering 
is when we lose an engine failure because there are inauspicious times for that to happen, like say, during takeoff. Well, that would be if we hadn't already planned for those contingencies. From the outset of every flight, pilots are already planning on losing an engine. That way, if we lose one at the worst possible time, like during takeoff, we're already ahead of the game. As part of this, we plan every takeoff within certain parameters to ensure we make prudent decisions in the event we lose an engine. These parameters are then distilled into a speed we call decision speed, or V1 for short. So what is decision speed? Well, you can think of decision speed sort of like a computer program's if statement. If an engine fails before decision speed, we'll be rejecting the takeoff and coming to a stop on the runway. Else, if it fails afterward, we'll be continuing the takeoff and coming back around for landing. So how do we calculate decision speed? Well, by calculating the weight of our empty aircraft, the fuel, the passengers, and the cargo, we know the aircraft's takeoff weight. By taking that weight and plugging it into that aircraft manufacturer's performance data, then accounting for weather conditions and runway length, we now know how the aircraft will perform. Once we know that, we can determine decision speed based on balanced field length, which is the point that accelerate stop distance equals accelerate go distance. Now that might sound complex, but it isn't. Accelerate stop distance is the distance required to accelerate, experience an engine failure, recognize it, and bring the aircraft to a stop. Accelerate go distance is the distance required to accelerate, have an engine failure, continue the takeoff, and clear the opposite end of the runway by at least 35 feet. With those two figures in mind, it stands to reason that as we gain speed in our takeoff run, the distance it takes to stop increases with each passing second. Simultaneously, the distance it takes to continue decreases, and at a certain speed, those two distances will be the same. At that exact speed, and from that point forward, it makes more sense to continue the takeoff run rather than to stop the aircraft. It may be counterintuitive and go against the instinct of the average person, but in fact, it's safer. To put it in another way, V1 is the maximum speed you can decide to bring the aircraft to a stop within the remaining field length. However, it's also the minimum speed to continue the takeoff with a single engine. By calculating and abiding by this speed on every takeoff, we always have a plan for an engine failure. Before I line up on a runway, I know exactly what to do if I lose an engine at any point during the takeoff, but to further put your mind at ease, you should know that the planning really doesn't stop there. Remember when I said that an engine failure would degrade overall aircraft performance? Well, that isn't much of an issue if we're taking off from Kansas City. But if we're departing from places like Las Vegas, where there's rapidly rising terrain in all directions, more detailed planning is required. This involves a predetermined plan for what course we'll be flying should we continue taking off with only one engine. For example, in a flat place like Kansas, our plan is to fly straight until our immediate action items are complete, then turn back toward the airfield as soon as practical. However, in Vegas, we've predetermined the exact series of turns required not to hit any mountains, considering our reduced climb performance. For example, when departing runway 26 right in Vegas, should we have an engine failure at V1, we'll proceed straight for 3 miles before turning right to a magnetic heading of 35 degrees, then proceed to a distance of 13 miles before turning again to a 100 degree heading. And mind you, we have a plan like this for every runway. For example, if instead we're departing from runway 19 left and lost the engine below 3,200 feet, we would climb straight out until reaching 4 miles from the runway, then turn towards a heading of 40 degrees, after flying that heading for at least 13.6 miles, we'll perform another turn to a 60 degree heading. However, if we lost the engine above 3,200 feet, we'd simply just continue on our usual departure course, but stop and perform a holding pattern at a specific predetermined point on the flight plan. If we lost an engine after that point on the departure path, we would continue as usual until holding at a different point. And finally, if we lose the engine after that point, we know we have the terrain clearance to continue as if nothing happened. So just to drive this point home, this particular engine failure plan, which we call a complex special departure, has five possible contingency plans built within it. At the end of the day, with all this planning, the difference between a two-engine departure and a single-engine departure, even in an area where the terrain is a consideration, is just a sudden update to our course. But as you've likely already considered, takeoff isn't the only time we can lose an engine. We can also lose an engine at altitude, which creates another unique situation. If that happens, we probably no longer have enough thrust to maintain our normal cruising altitude, so we'll begin what's called a drift down. A drift down is a loss of altitude due to a lack of performance on a single engine. In this case, depending on the circumstances, we'll be descending to one of two possible altitudes. 
If we're above mountains, we'll likely steer away from them and begin drifting down to our predetermined obstacle clearance altitude. If the terrain isn't a consideration, we'll likely drift down to our long-range cruise altitude to save fuel and start our journey toward the nearest airfield. In either case, the plane will be under control and will likely have plenty of fuel. The only thing that's changed is that we're suddenly headed for a different airport and, well, your vacation travel plans have probably been ruined. Sorry. Taking all this into consideration, we've established that in most cases, because of the extensive work put into our flight planning to eliminate the risk of possible engine failure, actually losing one is typically not a dangerous event. That being said, I'd be remiss if I ended this video without mentioning that rare situations in which losing an engine is a big deal. If you ask any real airline pilot, they'll probably tell you that there's one or maybe two situations that cause the hair on the back of their necks to stand up. Fire and uncontained engine failures. That is, an engine failure is so severe that internal components of the engine are shot out of the nacelle as if from a cannon, and they can damage nearby systems and even the fuselage of the aircraft. What makes these events particularly unsettling is their unknowns. If you haven't noticed, planning is the key to eliminating risk in other situations we've discussed. The problem with fires and uncontained engine failures is that once they've occurred, there's just so much we don't know. Such as, what was the cause of the fire? Will it spread? Will fumes enter the cabin? How much time do we have? Will the uncontained failure cause more critical damage? Exacerbating these concerns is the factor of time. Before we had plenty of time after the engine failed because the situation was unchanging. But with fire or flying debris, there could be other subsequent failures. Even worse, it could asphyxiate passengers and crew. So it should go without saying that both engine fires and uncontained failures require us to move quickly and decisively to get the aircraft back on the ground. To highlight these risks, let's look at Southwest Airlines Flight 1380. Now, some might argue that the engine failure that Flight 1380 experienced was contained because pieces of the cowl damaged the fuselage rather than the internal engine components, which typically define what an uncontained engine failure is. But that's just semantics to me. If I had an engine failure that damaged the fuselage, I'm pretty sure that feel pretty uncontained. In any case, when we examine the engine failure's subsequent events, we can gain insight into the unpredictability of these types of failures. In the case of Flight 1380, the flying debris damaged the fuselage and resulted in an explosive depressurization that culminated in a tragic loss of life. However, not even this scenario is the worst I can imagine. The worst possible scenario, in my opinion, would be an uncontained engine fire or failure resulting in a cabin fire. Few things scare a pilot more than a cabin fire because the problem is you just don't have much time to evacuate. In the FAA's internal review of various cabin fires, they've coined a blunt statistic called time to becoming non-survivable. In it, we can see that depending on the aircraft model, we have anywhere between 7 and 30 minutes to get the aircraft on the ground and everyone evacuated before a loss of life occurs. If this were to happen at cruise altitude, we'd be racing against the clock. Fortunately, both fires and uncontained engine failures are rare. In 1993, a study conducted by the International Cabin Water Spray Research Management Group, which was assembled to determine the viability of adding water sprayers to passenger aircraft, determined that in the preceding 26 years, there were only 95 incidents involving fires across the globe. Additionally, they determined that only 16% of aviation accidents featured fires and only 22% of fatalities were caused by fire-related factors such as smoke inhalation or burns. Even more of the fires that do break out, it isn't as if we don't have further mitigation tools to solve the problem before an engine fire becomes a life-threatening cabin fire. For example, on a typical airliner, there will be bottles of halon that can be fired into the engine to extinguish a fire before it gets the opportunity to progress further. Similarly, halon bottles are also typically mounted in the cargo compartment to counteract fires that may have been caused by passengers' luggage. So, we know the frequency of fires is low to begin with, but even if one does break out, we aren't doomed yet as there's a significant chance we can extinguish it. In terms of uncontained engine failures, the statistics are similarly reassuring. In 1989, the FAA published a report called Statistics on Aircraft Gas Turbine Engine Rotor Failures that occurred in the U.S. commercial aviation during 1985. In the study, the FAA determined that of the 273 rotor failures in 25.6 million flight hours, only 14 were uncontained engine failures. Of those 14 uncontained engine failures, there was no data on what percentage caused subsequent substantial damage to the aircraft. That being said, it's reasonable to assume that less than half of them damaged critical aircraft components. So, to summarize statistically speaking, most engine failures aren't a big deal, most aren't uncontained, and most don't cause cabin fires. As we conclude, you may have one lingering question in your mind, however. Let's say all of that is true. 
If they're really not a big deal, why do we still classify a run-of-the-mill engine failure as a critical emergency? Well, that's because as you've probably heard in the past, it's better to be safe than sorry. Since we can't be 100% sure that it's a simple engine failure based on our cockpit indications alone, we can't just assume that's the case. We also can't be 100% sure that a contained failure won't progress into an uncontained one, or that a damaged component won't suddenly cause a fire. So, in most cases, while we could argue that losing an engine is typically not even an event worth an emergency declaration because of the potential that the situation may suddenly become more severe, we can declare an emergency and return to the field as fast as practical. So, while the vast majority of engine failures are no big deal, we still treat them as one, just to plan, and you might be picking up on a theme here, for all possible contingencies. So, that's it. It's possibly more than you ever wanted to know about engine failures, but I hope this explanation makes it clear that from the inception of an aircraft's design through the training and everyday planning and procedures executed by your pilots, every effort has been made to ensure that an engine failure will almost certainly result in nothing more than frustrated travel plans. It really is marvelous how the work of many great minds has allowed us to take an event as fear-inducing as an engine failure on an airliner and turn it into what is almost certainly a non-issue. It's one of the innumerable things that make aviation truly special.